I'll start the recording now. Um, so thank you so much to everyone who um, who's joining us today. I see lots of names that I know and some names that I don't, and that's always really exciting. Um, so uh, we're going to give you a bit of a presentation today on the subject of the, the roadmap for Archivatica and a product vision and some work that we've been doing at Artifactual Systems in support of these activities. And um, as you've entered the um, the call, you're muted by default, so um, I'm not hearing any background noise from from anybody. So that's that's great. Um, if you could just stay muted, unless you have a question or a comment to make, and we are going to ask that maybe you save your questions or comments until the end. Um, you can type them in chat any, at any time if you choose to, but um, we think that some of your questions might be answered as we go through the slides. Um, so it's probably best to just hold them uh, for the end. And uh, we also have some feedback mechanism set up that you can provide us with comments and questions um, after the fact. So if you don't, if you think of something later that you want to keep the conversation going, I think that's um, totally uh, what we're hoping will happen. Um, so uh, this is what we're going to do today. I'm just going to introduce uh, myself and, and Joel, who is also going to uh, present to you today um, to, and talk about like what is this subject that we're talking about and how have we managed these things in the past and sort of where we're going next, what we're trying to drive towards and, and uh, what's, what's going to happen next. And uh, then we have some, que some question time. You can give questions to us and we also have questions for you. You don't have to have answers off the top of your head. Uh, you're welcome to answer them immediately on, on the webinar if you choose to. But if, um, but again, we have some feedback mechanisms sort of set up so that you can um, give us feedback on these, these um, questions uh, another time if you want. Um, so by way of introduction, uh, my name is Sarah Romke. I'm the program manager for Archivematica. I've worked at Artifactual Systems for a number of years now and primarily have worked on the Archivematica project. Um, so as program manager, I'm just responsible for um, communicating with the community and um, representing our, our users um, in our development team along with our other analysts and um, helping out uh, clients of Artifactual Systems who are Archivematica users, um, as well as uh, community users on the user forum when I'm able to. And uh, later in the presentation, Joel Simpson is going to speak as well. Joel is a business analyst and, and works as a consultant for Artifactual Systems, and he's been really helping us with this uh, product vision and road mapping process. He uh, brings a lot of experience and expertise to that kind of process, uh, which is like as will be revealed in my slides, something that we've never really gone through before. So um, having his perspective has been, uh, been really handy. And if any of you, uh, several of you on the call were at our very first ever Archivematica camp in Michigan, and I would say that's what Joel broke onto the scene as an Archivematica participant. Uh, so you may have met Joel at that camp a few years back. Um, so First, I just, uh, you know, we'll talk about like what are these things that we're that we're here to talk about. So what is a product vision? And there's all kinds of like if, you know, this is defined very differently in, in different uh, fields for sure. And you could um, find all kinds of answers to this question. But this is where um, where we started as what is a product vision for us, for Archivematica, um, for Artifactual Systems, like what, what are we trying to articulate here? So for us, a product vision is a statement that is going to help us improve the quality of the software. So articulate like what we want the software to do and where we want it to go and, um, and that should improve the, the quality of it over time and make it better for users. Um, engage and align with the community. So make sure that we're hearing your voices and understanding what it is that you need and want the software to do. Um, all of the development that we do should be in uh, in aid of things that, that our users actually want to do. Um, a product vision should help us manage risk um, in the sense that Archivematica needs maintenance and it has dependencies and these things need to be managed over time. Sometimes um, the software tools um, and languages that we're using underlying the code become out of date and, and that needs to be managed as a risk. It helps us set priorities. So what is the, like what should our top priorities be? How, um, um, the, the first things that we work on should be things that are in um, in line with the product vision. And it also helps the community plan and contribute to the project. So if you all understand 
uh, what the, the vision is for the product. And if you can help collaborate and form that vision, then it helps you plan ahead. And uh, particularly with the roadmap, it helps you um, understand like what's coming up next. And maybe it'll even down to the kind of detail of might help you decide when your next upgrade is going to be like that kind of thing. So um, we want to um, make it something that's helpful both for us internally, but also for the whole community to use. And what is a product roadmap? And again, you can, uh, like there's um, many ways to manage product roadmaps and we're gonna talk a little bit about that later. Um, but for us, what, what we're aiming for is to have a description of what's scheduled, what's in progress and what's on the wish list. So scheduled items, um, uh, these are things that have the scope and effort ha ha are pretty well defined and work has already been planned. And these are the most detailed issues that we have in our GitHub issues repository, which I will get to later. So, or at least they should be. <laughs> um, so uh, these are features or enhancements or bug fixes that we understand the scope of. We know exactly what we want to do and we're doing it. Um, and we've um, generally decided what release it will go in as well. Um, in progress means it's being actively worked on. The scope may or may not be well defined or understood. When things are in progress, they're still at an analysis phase and um, there could be adjustments that either come from us or the clients who work with us. Um, those of you who have used Archivematica for a long time or are clients of Artifactual Systems, you know that we, we work on this sort of bounty model of um, software development. So we're working often, usually, directly with, with clients, with users of the software to determine um, what the feature will look like and how it gets integrated into the software. So as things are in progress, it's, um, there's still room for some flexibility in the scope. And these have like kind of a medium level of detail. Um, so we have like a general idea of what we want to do, but uh, we still might be scoping out the work and so on. And therefore, it's not ready to be scheduled. We're not ready to say this is going to be in such and such a release because we just don't know enough yet. And then wish list items are identified as a need either by us or by one of you or somebody who's using Archivematica, um, but not yet either like sponsored uh, in the, the sense of um, somebody hiring um, artifactual systems to sponsor, to develop the feature. Um, or not yet being worked on by any other software developers or partners or, or so on, or it's not otherwise been prioritized. And these are sort of the least, these we have the least amount of detail about. So um, at a minimum, like each of these, uh, everything that's on the um, roadmap, whether it's scheduled or in progress or wish list, should have some issue defined for it. And we've been managing our issues in a GitHub repository, which I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. Um, but things that are on the wish list, those are pretty undetailed. And we haven't spent time scoping them or prioritizing them or maybe even really like fully understanding what the issue is. So um, when we started uh, talking about this internally, we um, one of my colleagues at Artifactual made a really interesting comment, and that's that that product roadmaps. When you look at them, like if you Google software product roadmap, you'll see tons and tons of examples, and they have a tendency to be very linear. Like this, uh, you know, it's like a car moving along a road, and first it's going to stop um, at, in this place, and then the next place, and then the next place, and it's like features being added over time. But in like most roadmaps, like like in the actual sense of like a map that you use to navigate um, a road, looks a little bit more like this. It tends to be more complex. Um, it's uh, there's various paths that you can take. There's some things that have to be done before another thing can be done. That car needs to leave that parking lot before it can get anywhere. But um, after it's out of the parking lot, it can take a number of different directions. And this is really what the reality of software development is more like. Um, but it's not really reflected very well in the way that software product roadmaps are articulated um, and that's just part of the challenge of articulating all of this so it does tend to be very like it has a, a sort of a linear um, visual when you look at a software roadmap but often time things are dependent on each other or if one project takes a a, a different kind of turn than expected it might have another effect on an upcoming feature um, so it's a little bit more complex, um, but having said that, it's worth articulating it and laying it out and making it more understandable, and that's what we're, we're aiming to do. So how have we managed these things in the past at Artifactual Systems? So the, 
the product vision, I feel like long-term Archivematica users especially have probably probably have a really good idea of, of what the underlying philosophy of Archivematica has been. And, um, you know, in the early days of Archivematica, you may have seen our um, founder and original designer of Archivematica, Peter Van Garderen, uh, out at conferences, and you would have seen Courtney Muma out at conferences, um, kind of like uh, banging on doors and, and ringing bells and, and saying like, this is what we're trying to do and this is what we believe in. Um, and all of those things were really important and, and it, uh, there was a lot of word of mouth, but we never really had anything formal or written down. This is sort of our first attempt to really do that. Um, and in terms of a roadmap, we have a wiki page, um, but it tends to kind of fall out of date and it's sort of one of those release management processes that, um, you know, it's very late in the release process when we remember oh yeah we forgot to update the roadmap so people don't know what's coming in this release um, and we also had a wiki page for wish list items but it just became sort of a dumping ground of like you know here's here's some stuff that we'd like to see happen in the future um, if somebody had a comment on the user forum uh, for a feature that wasn't sponsored that would often be our response like hey we can add it to our wish list but the wish list is was a pretty static document and wasn't really going anywhere so we've implemented some changes to try to um, formalize these things and make it so that these uh, wish list items and ideas, which are great ideas, actually like move their way through a product pipeline or at least have a chance to do that. So in that, um, uh, to that end, we've been working our way towards a more community-driven Archivatica. And what does that mean? It, could mean all kinds of things, but I'll tell you a little bit about like what some specific activities that we've been doing and why we're doing this and what we're kind of hoping to achieve with it. So one is that we've implemented processes for filing issues. Um, so we've used different things in the past. If you're a longtime user, then you may have known about Redmine, it was projects.artifactual.com, and we still, uh, that website still exists because it's still used for internal, like that's how, um, people who work for Artifactual get paid, basically, like we still use it for time tracking, but we're not using it any longer to um, publicly file issues about the project. Then we, we moved away from Redmine and into GitHub, but as you may know about Archivematica, it's spread across many repositories. There's sort of the core Archivematica repository, and there's uh, the storage service, and then there's many small repositories that all kind of add up to one software project. So we decided that we'd have one repository to rule them all, and we implemented that um, over the, this past summer. And, we, and when we did that and announced it, we made some guidelines for how to label things um, so that that it makes it easier for, um, hopefully, easier for people who are looking at the issues to understand sort of what the status is, but also makes it easier for us internally to manage it as a project. So some of the labels have like um, meaning for us and our internal processes to make sure that these issues are um, moving along and, and, and finding their way into the testing pipeline and making sure they're getting tested before they're released and all that kind of thing. Um, we also implemented an issue first guideline. So um, th what this means is we don't accept code um, from anyone, either like an artifactual employee or otherwise, unless they've filed an issue first. So the first thing to do is to describe what it is, what the problem is that you're encountering. And then the code that you submit again, regardless of who you work for, um, is in the form of a pull request. And uh, that pull request should be connected to an issue. And ideally, that issue is understandable by uh, a, a pretty average human being. <laughs> um, Archivematic is a pretty technical product. And um, in one way or another, its users have um, at least some technical expertise if you're doing some, um, if, you, if you're undertaking digital preservation, then you've got some technical chops for sure. Um, but it should be a pretty understandable by like, I would say an average Archivematica user. So that um, if you have a desire to look at the um, issues affecting Archivematica in whole, whether that be um, things that it doesn't do that people want it to do or things that should work that don't work because they're defects or bugs. Um, you should be able to look at those issues, read them, and understand them. 
Um, another activity that we've done is we've um, assigned a product owner and, and I've taken on that role. So this is part of agile methodology, if you're familiar at all with, with agile software development. And basically my responsibility as product owner is to triage issues and try to gather as much feedback from all stakeholders to put the most important issues at the top. Now, that this is a challenge. It's I'm not gonna lie. It's not always easy, and I have to check my own biases sometimes. Because sometimes an issue will be filed that I'm like, oh, I'd love to see that happen. I really want to see that happen. So it'd be tempting as product owner to put it at the top of the pile. Um, but that's not how things work in reality. It's it's very much a group process, and we work on it together at Artifactual. And it's um, to a certain degree also um, impacted by who is sponsoring what features. So um, that's our business model at Artifactual. Um, artifactual systems needs to make money and pay people to do all of this work. Um, so if people are paying us for things, they do tend to be prioritized. Um, but we're uh, we're working towards um, sort of a flow, you could say, of issues coming in, being uh, triaged for their priority, and being worked on and making their way into the pro into the product. And that's what a product owner does. If you're interested in that kind of uh, in agile methodology and in product owner work, there's lots of resources online to, to read more about that. I'm not going to belabor it any, any further. Um, it's an interesting uh, way of doing work and might even interest you for the way that you work in your institutions, like not with software development, doing other things as well. There's all kinds of ways that you can use agile methodology. Um, we've also implemented some new tooling. Um, so we're using a tool called Waffle, um, and we use this to move our GitHub issues from the backlog, where they're first filed, all the way through to done. And this is part of what I do as product owner to sort of like um, move things around and, and triage them and prioritize them. And this is a public link, like anybody can can view that if you want, if you're interested. It's a very good tool. We've, we've been very happy with it. It's, it's really helped quite a lot. Um, Trello, we've been using Trello for um, sort of a higher level uh, release planning. So we have an internal Trello board where we can um, look at, at features at sort of a broad level and say like, okay, what's going into what release upcoming and what's being worked on and what's being sponsored and what's still unsponsored and that kind of thing. Um, and we're also going to be using Trello at least as an interim as a road mapping tool. And uh, Joel's gonna give you a tour of that in a little bit. So you'll see it in action. If you've never used Trello before, this will be a good introduction to how it works. So um, what are we gonna do next? So next we're, um, well, I guess this is already underway, but we're developing a product vision and roadmap. And that's um, what this webinar is largely about. And we're gonna talk, uh, Joel is going to lead that discussion um, because he's uh, been leading us in, in that process at Artifactual. So uh, more on that in a moment. Um, another thing, another piece of sort of tooling in a way um, that we are implementing is uh, the idea of a request for change or um, architectural decision records and making a process for that. So what this would look like is a, it's sort of a, at a broader level than filing an issue. It would be a way of, um, of articulating a request for Archivematica to, to, for something to change in Archivematica and to make a record of what the discussion was and what the outcome of that discussion was. So for example, um, there's one um, initial proposal in this um, labs uh, repo if, you, if you're interested in taking a look after the presentation is done. But basically in that proposal, it's saying um, the way that Archivematica writes METS is uh, rather convoluted because there's several ways to do that um, and several different things happening all within the same project to write METS and that doesn't make any sense. And the proposal is to make it more streamlined and to use one method of writing METS. So that would be sort of a back-end thing that like users may not notice happening, but if you're working within the code, it's a fundamental change to the way that Archivematica works, like in its internals. Um, so uh, the idea behind having a, like some kind of request for change is that there's an opportunity for people to weigh in and discuss it. And it, so it could be something like that that's quite internal to the, um, to the workings of Archivematica, or it could be something that's like a little bit more user-facing. So if, if somebody were to say, 
Um, I want to completely change the way that you start transfers. I think it should happen in a completely different way. Uh, that would be something that would be a good candidate to file a request for change because that's a big change that would affect a lot of users and we would want to see some community discussion and some feedback before we implemented anything like that. Um, we're also working on settling into a release cadence and it's always a balance for us between do we do many, many small releases that only contain a few changes or new features or do we do very few big releases um, and we're trying to figure out the balance of what works better for Archivematic as a project, Archivematic as a community, but also Artifactual as a company because at this moment in time, we're the ones uh, who are doing that labor, so we need to make it sustainable for the company, because uh, if Artifactual sinks at this moment in time, that wouldn't be good for Archivematica, the project. Um, so we need to, to balance all of those factors, and we're kind of settling into a, uh, uh, we're hoping to settle into a release cadence and to have the confidence to be able to publicly say, this is when we expect our next releases to happen. Um, those of you who have worked with us in the past have known that that's been a real pain point for us, um, you know, some of you on this call, you've, you've uh, got, you've been told a release was coming at a certain date and it didn't come at that date. I know that some of you have had that experience. So we're trying to get better at that. Um, just to give you an example, our last major release was uh, just a few weeks ago, although we're, we're quickly barreling towards Christmas here, aren't we? So um, I guess it was, uh, it was November 19th. It was my husband's birthday. I should remember that date. <laughs> so just to share this experience with you all, our internal target for that release was October 31st and we got it out on November 19th. For us, that's a big improvement over telling people, oh, we anticipate doing this release in June and having it out in December. Um, so we're uh, getting better. <laughs> we're having better processes for releases. We have a bigger team now, which really, really helps and a very talented team and that really, really helps. Um, but uh, that's a pain point for us that um, we want to get better at because it'll be better uh, um, for the team working on Archivematica full-time and also better for everybody who's using Archivematica. Um, and we want to improve our ability to work with external contributors. And we've done a few things um, to to help lay the groundwork for this. Um, we've laid out expectations a lot more clearly. We still have some work to do on that for sure. Um, but like that, that thing I was talking about, about having to file an issue first before you submit a PR, like that's a relatively new thing for us to have articulated. Um, we've also, we make community um, pull requests part of the triage process now. Um, I was telling some, some colleagues just uh, within this past week that, um, it wasn't that long ago that if we received a community pull request, it would fill me with panic. <laughs> I would have this feeling of, what do we do? I don't know what to do with this. I, how, like, what, is it a priority? And I want to, we want to include it because it was so like, you know, uh, you know, it's important to do that, but, but, but we didn't have like processes for actually dealing with it. And now when we get a community pull request, it's like, oh, this is just part of our process. We know what to do with this. It's a lot less panic inducing. So small PRs, small pull requests, small contributions are no biggie. Like we kind of know how to handle that. Um, big PRs, uh, still kind of a biggie. <laughs> it's still a big, uh, it would be a, a big thing for us to receive a huge um, pull request. And by huge, I mean touches a lot of areas of the code, is a very big change, that kind of thing. We've worked more with um, external people who we've hired to do large pull requests. And that was, it has been an experience that's gone very, it has gone very well, but also that we've been able to learn a lot from. Um, but um, we have a ways to go before we can work with a partner who wants to contribute a large amount of code. But we, we're committed to doing that. We, we want to get there. So why are we moving in this direction? Um, it may be obvious, but um, part of it is better management of maintenance tasks through better planning. We want Archivematica to be a sustainable project that is usable for a long, long time and doesn't fall apart because we've fallen down on, on software maintenance and keeping things up to date. Um, it's just in alignment with our company philosophy. This is just, this is how this company started, was a very community-minded thing, and we've always um, really um, banged the open source drum, and we will continue banging that drum for as long as we live. <laughs> um, our 
big goal as a project and as a company is to see as many people sustainably preserving digital heritage as possible. Um, we just really, like, frankly, whether or not you do it with Archivematica, we just are happy to see people doing digital preservation. That's like really all we want. We feel that we're like what we want to do is provide a product that allows you to do that. Um, but to do that, we need to know that what we're working on is the right thing to work on. So by being more community minded, community driven and understanding our community better, we'll be able to get more checks and balances to know that we're working on the right things. Um, that's basically where we are at that. So at this point, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and Joel Simpson is going to jump in and he is going to uh, talk and share his screen and talk about uh, these next couple of points. You good to go, Joel? Yes, thanks, Sarah. Um, I will be, just one second as I share my screen here. Um, Right, so I'm, uh, I presume you can all hear me, and I'll just see if I can put this into. Uh, okay, so um, I'm gonna start talking about the, the product vision and then get into the actual um, roadmap in a moment, so. Joel, just before you get started, do you wanna move that Zoom widget with the names um, off to the side or, or down? Right. It's, we can see that too. Zoom doesn't hide it, unfortunately. There you go, how's that? Uh, no, we can still see it. <laughs> Sorry, it's it's blocking some of the. Um, uh, oh, sorry, 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 sorry. No, it's not you. It's not your screen. It's my screen. That's incredibly silly of me. Sorry, ignore it's me. Fine over here. <laughs> sorry. Okay, very good. I was I wasn't sure what I was trying to click on there. Okay, cool. So, um, product vision. So, we've attempted to to sort of set out a vision of what Archimatic is all about on one page. And this is sort of uh, just a visual that fits onto a page. Um, there's a Google Doc where we've written about a page of text to try and describe this in, in actual words. Uh, and we'll give the link to that later. So um, we'd love to hear uh, what people think about it, any, any feedback or comments that you might have. Um, this, is, uh, you know, this is very much a first draft. It's based on a number of discussions that we had um, at Artifactual over the past uh, few months. Um, it's, you know, just to be clear, it's not, it's, it, it's not the vision that we're trying to sort of sell for what we think Archivematica should be from Artifactual. Um, this is us trying to articulate what we think we've heard from the community, from different users, uh, whether they're clients or not, from partners who, well, we've other vendors, for instance, um, that are using Archivematica or selling Archivematica services or have collaborated with us on client projects. Um, and other other you know broader members of the of the community um, you know people on standards bodies or um, uh, sponsors and funders um, and the the goal of it really was just before getting into um, talking about ro the roadmap and the thing you know what needs to be developed and what the direction that the product needs to go uh, we thought it was just really good to have to have a starting foundation of well, what do we think it acts actually about today um, and Hopefully this, uh, this does that. Um, as I said, this is sort of a first draft, so it, op we're open to changing any of this, uh, but we just felt this might be a good starting point for trying to describe it quickly. So um, at the center of this diagram, we put the, uh, the community of trying to sort of represent um, all the diverse uh, different types of people within the, the broader Archivematica community. Um, and then the, those little speech bubbles are trying to summarize the key benefits or goals that the um, community gets. So this is more a, a summary of um, sort of the point of Arch Archivematica than it is, uh, you know, just a summary of the functionality of the product. Um, inevitably, it's, it's a, a bit of both, but uh, this is really about, you know, who's it for and why do they, why are they here with us? Um, so we then organize that into sort of five broad themes that try and sort of talk to the, the broad areas, the broad value propositions that um, Archivematica is, is all about. So we should start with the integrated tools for preservation actions. Um, I'm, I, you know, I'm sort of assuming if you're here on the call that you uh, already know something about Archivematica. We uh, support a whole 
wide range of preservation actions. We provide all of the tools that's sort of integrated. And part of that is um, that, you know, there's, there's still a significant chunk of the community that needs something that is uh, easy to, easy to get started with. Uh, you know, it's a daunting um, task, digital preservation. There's a lot to it. Uh, and Archivematica um, combines another of a number of different open source tools uh, within it. And um, you can relatively quickly um, get up and running and actually doing uh, digital preservation with it. Um, at the same time, uh, there's a, you know, the next goal there is around flexibility because there is, there are many, many different ways that this can be done. Um, there are, you know, ways of configuring whole workflows. Uh, there are different needs, you know, when you're working with different uh, other systems. Um, and there are lots of, you know, when you get down to the level of uh, specific formats, uh, there are lots and lots of different uh, rules or ways that you can go about um, carrying out preservation actions. And um, we want to make it flexible and configurable so that people um, can, you know, pick the preservation actions or do the things that they need to do that make sense in their context. Um, and here we also talk about, uh, you know, pres preserved material being easy to use. So this is trying to not lose sight of, although our users are people preserving stuff, um, you know, their end goal is to make it um, accessible and usable and trustworthy um, for other users. Um, so, that's you know well, what all of those preservation actions are sort of in aid of. The second thing we talk about here is uh, building the knowledge required for effective preservation. So this is perhaps one of the more aspirational ones, but it's it's really uh, just recognizing that digital preservation is a very daunting task. There's there's a you can go down many many deep deep rabbit holes of learning about specific um, techniques or um, formats and so on um, different domains. Uh, and in a way, with all of the things that, that Archivematica provides, it is kind of a platform for understanding what's possible and uh, helping to sort of build your, your knowledge and understanding of what's possible and your trust that you're doing the right things um, uh, to preserve uh, digital content. Um, we'll talk a, bit, I'll talk a bit more about that. There's some um, stuff coming up in the roadmap that helps speak to that, so hopefully that'll help um, illustrate the, the point of that a little bit more. Um, the third theme then is, is automation. So this is really about saving time and effort and just recognizing digital preservation is in most places a, um, a problem of, uh, there is a problem of scale. There's a lot of it to be done. There are lots of individual things and some level of automation is required. And Archivematica even, uh, you know, without what we often think of as automation, without automation tools, without um, uh, lots of integrations or whatever, and even just, you know, manually using the user face and taking transfers through the process of creating SIPs and creating APES, um, it still has a lot of uh, automation because you're not having to, you know, it's going and um, triggering the different tools based on the rules that you've um, configured and, uh, and guiding you through the process. So that's a, a, a you know, Here's the important thing. It's worth uh, talking a little bit also about, the, you know, reliability. There is a um, uh, we need we need to be able to um, set off auto automation and trust that it's um, reliably doing what it should be doing. Um, so then, fourth fourth theme we have here is around the configuration and integration framework. Uh, so this is about um, being able to customize how you're using Archivematica, whether you need more than one pipeline, whether you're integrating with other systems, um, and, uh, and making it uh, easy to understand, you know, for um, how do you fit it into your world? How do you make it work? Um, and then finally, uh, we talk about this uh, open source ecosystem. So a big part of the value proposition of, of Archivematic is that it's open source, um, and we, we believe there are a whole range of benefits from that. Um, it's not just open source. I mean, it's, it's um, we talk a bit about the, the ethos. We've even talked about it, uh, sort of actually talking about this theme as being about being community driven. Um, because it's, we, we don't just um, have an open source license and 
you know, let people see the code and so on. We are, we're uh, through, <clears throat> Uh, through things like this webinar and uh, all the many other things we're trying to do, trying to encourage um, uh, community involvement and actually being driven by the, the needs of the community. Um, and we often talk about, you know, Archive Matica as an open source project should be bigger than uh, Artifactual as a company. And so, uh, as Sarah alluded to, we're trying to get, get to a place where um, we can be even more... Um, collaborative and inclusive uh, and uh, make it easier for others to be um, contributing to the software in a whole range of ways and not, not just having to pay artifactual uh, for the privilege. Uh, and what that's about is uh, like, so we put sustainable there. Part of that is that, um, as Sarah alluded to, you know, part of one of the big risks with any software is it's an institution. You, uh, complex applications require a lot of investment to um, understand and, um, and the software might be free in an open source world, but you're still costs a lot to, to, to use it um, properly. Um, and so you want that investment to be sustainable and uh, you want to sort of manage the risk that artifactual is not going to be around in, in three years uh, and that you haven't invested in something that's just going to go away. Um, so that's a big part of that. Um, it's also just part of, um, you know, being community driven just for the value of being uh, coming from the community and that's what it's for. Um, so that's basically the, um, the high level um, vision in a nutshell. I'm gonna, I'll leave it there. As I said, um, you know, there's a Google doc. We would love to, well, to hear your questions later about whether these are the right themes, whether that's as a five minute summary, whether that captures what you think Archivematic is about or, or whether that feels surprising or, or missing things. Uh, and there's a Google document where you can put in a lot of those comments in. So how does that then relate to the roadmap? So um, we've used those themes to help sort of categorize a number of things in the roadmap. Um, this is high level what it uh, looks like. I'm going to um, go into Trello and show you uh, what this looks like live. Uh, hopefully you can all see this. Um, so Sarah talked about uh, the roadmap and, the, and we've sort of divided into three broad categories. So there's things that are scheduled. Uh, so these are ones where we've, we've basically been able to define the scope. We understand the effort enough that we can um, reliably say, yep, we're going to put this into the next release um, because we understand, um, you know, when, how long it's going to take us to finish it or, uh, and, and get it incorporated. Um, so I'll, I'll talk through the content of these in a second, but we've got some scheduled stuff for a point release because there's a couple of defects that we want to pull up, put out pretty fast. Um, we've then um, done an initial scoping for the next release, which is going to be 1.9, uh, and I'll talk through those things. And then we get into uh, work in progress um, items. So this is stuff that we're definitely working on. Um, uh, there are, I, you know, all of these are um, sponsored in, in some fashion, um, uh, and so we expect them to happen, but they're perhaps not defined well enough to know exactly when they'll happen. Uh, so uh, conceivably, some of these could even get pulled into um, 1.9. Uh, these are more likely candidates for uh, a 1.10 uh, type of release. And then finally, we have some wish list items. And the point of that is really just to try and signal important stuff that really needs to happen. Um, it's not exhaustive. I mean, we could say probably at, at this early stage, none of this is exhaustive and it needs a bit more work. But particularly the wish list isn't exhaustive because our goal isn't really to just like dream up everything that might be nice to do. Uh, it's to really highlight stuff that, has, that, that is really important to do uh, or is on our radar that we're having conversations about and so on. Um, you know, for a few reasons. One is just like help people to plan. So if you're thinking about um, one of the broader points of this, if you're thinking about, um, you know, when, when should you next be planning for your next Archive Matter up upgrade, being able to see when these things are going to happen allows you to do that in a more informed way. Uh, and the, the work in progress and the wish list stuff is actually really more about signaling, sort of saying like, this is what's coming up and what we're working on and, and providing a space for, uh, to sort of invite, 
further contributions or interest. So, um, we, you know, very often, um, Historically, we've, we've, you know, a particular client asks for things and a fair bit of work happens between Artifactual and that client. And um, it isn't that big. We've tried in, in, in limited ways in the past, but it's often not as, as visible or um, open to a, a broader community. So a lot of that is, you know, really driven by you put all of these things in. Uh, all of these things are linked to things in um, the GitHub issues repository that Sarah talked about. So... Um, you can see all of the detail there, and that you know provides a whole platform for um, collaborating. So, just to race through relatively quickly uh, what all of these things are, because I'm sure many of you that's the main reason you're here. Um, so, within you can see within Charlie, um, within each of these has a description, and certainly everything that's scheduled has a link to the um, uh, GitHub issue. Uh, that describes it in more detail and where, you know, basically anyone can go in and um, add comments to that if, if you're interested in this or have a concern about it or, or anything, uh, have, you know, thoughts you can add um, to that. So quick race through of what's get, uh, scheduled. We have a delete di dips um, feature going in. So this is basically <clears throat> relatively small. It's uh, dealing with the fact that the storage service today there's nothing on the user interface uh, like a simple button to go and delete a dip. Um, so you can sort of do it manually behind the scenes, but then it's not um, recorded or recognized by the storage service itself. Um, we are doing a new API endpoint uh, in the 1.9 release to allow you um, to move uh, apes from one location to another and have that be recorded by the storage service. Um, something that's originally developed for MoMA and uh, we're making publicly available. Um, there are then uh, some, some configuration type things. Um, Elasticsearch upgrade. So we're currently on a, um, an out-of-date version of Elasticsearch and it needs to be um, updated. Um, internationalization is something that we did in 1.7 largely, um, but what we didn't do was, uh, didn't add was the ability to um, have different translations, different you know, language versions of the actual workflow steps. So when you're looking in the dashboard at microservices, you see all the work, the workflow jobs. Uh, and um, even though we have in 1.8, we released a number of the translations that were offered up by the community. Um, you'll see that in many parts of the UI, but you won't see that in the microservices. So uh, this is a, a technical change to allow that to happen. Uh, there's some details about why in, in there about why uh, that was not easy to do and took a bit more work. Um, there are a couple of minor, in, in 1.8, we introduced an integration with Dataverse, an open source uh, research data management repository. Um, there are a couple of sort of follow-on defect fixes that are going into that. Um, and then there are some other defect fixes. I haven't, we haven't listed the full scope of that, but I've linked to the waffle board here so you can see what's already tagged with the 1.9 milestone that'll get included in that. This will sort of evolve. Um, uh, over the coming weeks. So that's uh, scheduled stuff, work in progress. Um, uh, Simon Fraser University um, has a project going at the moment to improve uh, how we do information packaging. That's um, geared around uh, making it possible to keep transfers for a longer period of time. So improving some of the metadata quality there so that they can keep things in their backlog longer and sort of trust that they're gonna be able to um, uh, be able to deal with it properly when the time comes to get to it. Um, and that's also um, uh, going to deal with a constraint at the moment around in the backlog, uh, right now in the appraisal tab, um, uh, there's issues when your packages have more than a thousand files. So let's try and um, fix that. Uh, vintage Ape Reingest, this is about enabling, if you, if, um, for users that have created Apes prior to Archivematica version one, um, they can't cur currently be re-ingested. Uh, so this is uh, uh, going to fix that. Um, then we have uh, an internally sponsored uh, project to uh, improve, you know, one of the most common problems that we see um, as we operate our own hosted version of Archivematica is uh, just running out of uh, disk space in, der in various places. Uh, so this will introduce some improvements to uh, displaying um, what storage, uh, how storage is getting used, get sort of more accurate um, uh, 
uh, useful information to help manage that and uh, prevent um, uh, operational issues with disks filling up. Finally, um, I mentioned this sort of under the knowledge building thing. This is Preservation Action Registries Project, um, which uh, we've been doing with uh, Archivum Preservica, uh, JISC funded initial proof of concept, and the Open Preservation Foundation. Uh, there's a link to a website here. We're, you know, at the moment our um, participation is currently pretty much limited to uh, what we do as active members of the OPF. Uh, this is not a huge, uh, we don't have a huge amount of uh, funding for this at the moment, so there's not a ton of development work going on, um, but we will be talking about it at, at PASIG, um, and we are definitely actively seeking interested partners and, um, and funders to help this um, work. And this is really about um, making it easier to capture and share technical best practices um, for digital preservation. Uh, and then on the wish list, I'm going to keep it really quick to, to finish. There's at least a bit of time for questions. Um, uh, improved coverage of automated testing. Uh, this is something that really is a, a big constraint really for external um, collaborators uh, and, and, and us. I mean, just the, there's a ton of, uh, we have a lot of automated testing, but uh, we don't have great coverage of it. And so right now, every release requires a fair bit of regression testing to make sure that a new change doesn't break something else. Uh, and by improving that, we can make it easier for uh, just to reduce the overall cost of releases, but also to um, make it easier for external contributors to um, get involved. Uh, and we've been talking about that um, in particular with uh, just very recently with the Welcome Collection, who are interested in being a, a, a partner and a contributor, um, if not a, a traditional client in the way that, um, uh, that we've uh, normally, you know, usually run a lot of our client engagement. So they're also actually interested in contributing work to upgrade to Python 3. Currently, so a lot of our code is in Python 2. And um, uh, also update our, um, uh, the Django uh, web framework. Those are just important in maintenance pieces. Um, and they are also kind of logically things that would be, make sense to do before doing a lot of improvements to the UI, which is something else that would be really useful. Um, I just, I put on um, web accessibility um, compliance. That's something that comes up in RFPs a lot. It comes something that clients ask for. Uh, no one's sort of offered or shown much interest in funding that, uh, but we think that's important to do. Uh, we're sort of partially there, but uh, I think that needs some work. Um, and then another small thing, um, Building off from the 1.8 releases, uh, you know, we did a lot of improvements on performance and scalability that um, uh, it means you can do much larger transfers, but you still just at very the starting point of starting transfers, there's not great visibility of uh, uh, what's in, in process. So uh, that is the, um, uh, that's the roadmap in a nutshell. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about collaborating on it and kind of next steps. Um, so uh, as we said, all those roadmap items, or uh, perhaps not all of them in the wish list, but we're, our aim is to get there soon, um, have issues in GitHub. So that's really our, you know, there's guides there for how to contribute um, in the GitHub issues repository and then explanations about some, what, what's going on with labels and all of that kind of stuff. Um, it's a great platform for um, uh, keeping track of the detail. Part of the roadmap thing, of course, is recognizing that this is overwhelming we've got to a scale now where there's a, uh, you know, that issues re repo is busy. There's a ton of stuff. And so part of this is about providing a high level view. That Trello link is what I was just showing you. Um, you can't actually comment uh, there uh, cause it, we're sort of trying to drive, we don't want to sort of orphan uh, this stuff in something else. Uh, so trying to keep the actual comments and everything uh, with the issues. Um, but you, you can use it to kind of get a high level view and navigate to the issues that you might actually care about. Uh, and then finally, uh, just as the next steps, both of this stuff, both the vision and all those epic descriptions that are in Trello are in a couple of Google Docs that are open to anyone for comments. So we'd love to hear um, uh, what you think. And finally, um, I think that's about all I was going to say. And we can. Um, open it up to two questions. And, and these are questions, um, these are questions that we have 
for all of you, but we don't necessarily expect answers immediately, <laughs> like on your fingertips. Um, but if, if you'd like to chime in with a, with a comment or a question, you're welcome to. Um, and we have these questions in the roadmap document as well, so that, and that's open for comments um, by anyone. So uh, please do um, go ahead and comment there if you, if you have anything to say. Oh, I'm seeing a, com a question in, in chat um, about um, disk usage feature, include graphs and visuals like Windows Explorer has and break down which directories and subdirectories are consuming the most space. Um, not uh, 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 graphs and visuals are out of scope for this kind of, uh, for this particular feature, um, but there, there'll be more visible information, I believe, on, on directories and subdirectories um, and how they use up space and just kind of clarifying in the, um, making it easier for the user to understand where space is being used, yeah. Um, just a, a note about all these links too. Um, we're, we've recorded this, but that's a tough way to find your way to links. So I'm going to follow up in the user forum um, in the same announcement where we announced the webinar um, with all of the links uh, so that you and anybody uh, who maybe wasn't able to make it can, can follow up and, and read. Uh, there's a comment that it's encouraging to see thought and action put into community and accepting pull requests. Uh, thank you. We agree. <laughs> hey, Sarah, I'm, this is Max. Joining hey. some of my colleagues at the Bentley, but uh, just wanted to also give you some positive affirmation because it's exciting to see all this articulated and visualized. And so, just uh, kudos. Thanks. Any other questions or comments? Uh, there's a question about thought about moving management to a foundation rather than artifactual. Um, so th those of you who are familiar with our sibling project, um, Adam, Access to Memory, you might be aware that a foundation has recently been started for Adam 3. So it's a, a nonprofit external to Artifactual. Artifactual is a paying member of the foundation as are a number of, I believe at this moment in time, I believe it's exclusively Canadian institutions, but it's certainly open to international participation. So that's for Adam and to develop the next, uh, the next version of what Adam is. So this is all to, this is I'm bringing that up as a, an example because it's to say that Artifactual is absolutely not opposed to uh, foundation management of the software products that we currently manage. Um, we don't um, have any current plans or expectations for an Archivematica foundation. It's one of those things that it's a kind of a little tricky because it's it's something that um, I suspect anybody who would be interested in starting such a thing would want Artifactual to be, uh, you know, involved and on board, but it's probably not appropriate for Artifactual to be the, uh, like, the founding member of a foundation. Like, it's it should be community-driven, but it's, it's definitely, like, something that we're, we'd be happy to talk about. Um... There's a sorry. comment. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I, was, I was just going to say, sorry, I could probably comment to um, Halal's just asked. Oh, about, sure, um, yes. Please go ahead. Interoperability in the vision or roadmap. And is that something um, you all see as part of the application either now or in the future? So, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good point. I think, the, um, I think the text around configuration and integration speaks to interoperability. Um, it's certainly very important um, as a thing. I agree. So uh, that's something we can... Uh, Think about. I think this is one of those. This was one of those exercises where we're just like, uh, we we started wide thinking about everything and then tried to really tone it down to something that would fit on a page. Uh, and so, I think interoperability is probably not there more more about that constraint than anything else. Um, so, open to to thinking about how we reframe that. The other the other thing that's not in. I mean, one of the comments um, that we thought about but haven't yet acted on is. If you if you read the text, I mean, our current thing is uh, we don't actually even spell out. Um, you know, the, the there is a certain value proposition of just the a our apes being very um, the fact that you can go and interrogate them and so on. You don't actually need Archivematica to be able to go and 
uh, use use apes later, uh, and that's kind of not there either. Which is, I think, maybe not quite the interoperability thing that you're talking about, Halal. But um, I don't know. Could be could be similar. So I short way of saying it is uh, there's probably that and other gaps, and uh, we would love to hear um, any other ideas about sort of obvious. Uh, themes or benefits that that probably deserve to be spelled out up, you know, uh, highlighted. Any other questions or comments before we wrap up? I know for those of you in, in, uh, in Europe, it's the end of your day. <laughs> All right, so I will, um, well, I, I guess we'll wrap it up there. I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>